we were listening to some feedback and we were doing some thinking about what we could talk about during this 2021 um, Messi consult lecture series. And we're going to cover a lot of ground, but we're gonna sort of revolve around two themes throughout the year. Uh, one theme is to talk about adverse effects, prim primarily psychiatric adverse effects of medicines that are commonly used and that um, are oftentimes not thought of as producing potentially significant psychiatric adverse effects. So we're gonna talk about unusual but important side effects of commonly used medicines. And later in the year, we're going to switch to a sort of a review of foundations of psychopharmacology. We're going to go through various, each of the, each of the major neurotransmitter systems, talk about how neurotransmitters are made and where within the signaling system um, our pharmacological targets exist. Um, my feeling and that of Dr. Sarah Dugan, who will be sharing these lectures with me, is that thinking about drugs from a neurotransmitter system impact will be helpful in thinking about solving problems and identifying, um, identifying weird side effects. So with that background out of the way, let's talk about the possibility that psychosis can happen as a result of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Why we're talking about this, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are really widely prescribed medications. Um, by some estimates, they're up to 10% of all prescriptions written in the United States. In just one year, there are tens of millions of doses taken. Um, and so they're widely commonly used. They are in psychiatry becoming more interesting because as we more, more fully appreciate the role that inflammatory processes play in producing psychiatric symptoms. The focus is going to be on trying to dr make drug interventions that can target the inflammatory response. And the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs represented by agents such as aspirin or ibuprofen or naproxen um, are kind of low hanging fruit. They're fairly well known, they're fairly old and they're cheap. So why not? look at them to see if, if they can have useful psychotropic advantage. Um, and if you look in, in psychiatric literature, you'll find many papers that are coming up these days saying that adding, insert NSAID there, aspirin or celecoxib or, um, or something like that, adding an NSAID to an existing antidepressant or antipsychotic drug on average, it seems to have um, a benefit, at least for a significant portion of individuals. So most of the press and most of the papers that come out these days are favorable to the use of NSAIDs as augmenting agents. Um, but I think it's important to realize that there's like what's true for the majority is not true for everybody. There are people in, in that group that will have adverse effects. For example, um, the use of NSAIDs added to antidepressants has some data to support it. Meta-analysis broadly says that there may be a signal for efficacy. However, within those studies, there are studies that say that adding an NSAID to people that are on an antidepressant actually worsens anxiety. Um, so it's not one size fits all. Let's focus today on psychosis. And uh, as a review, I think for, for you guys, um, what we call psychosis has a lot of different pathways to it the most commonly studied one and probably the numerically the most common chemical involved in psychosis is dopamine. But you can get psychosis by interfering with glutamate signaling. You can get psychosis by augmenting certain serotonin receptors. And absolutely you can get psychosis from consequences of, of inflammatory processes. As I mentioned, they're kind of hot in psychiatry right now. Um, these are some points of interest relating to the psychosis and NSAIDs in the psychosis space. Uh, so several studies show that markers of inflammation predict the development of psychosis in a fairly large study um, by Metcalf and all looking at C-reactive protein, which is a very nonspecific biomarker for inflammation. 
looking at C-reactive protein during adolescence, like around 15 or 16 years old, um, was able to predict who by age 27 is going to be diagnosed with a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. Um, and so early life inflammatory, um, early life inflammation appears to be associated with higher risk for later life psychotic illness. Um, if you look at people that are already within a first episode of psychosis and look in those individuals for markers of inflammation, you'll see on average that inflammatory processes are revved up. Um, two enzymes, NOS and COX abbreviated here, that stands for nitric oxide, nitric oxide synthase and cyclooxygenase um, are elevated in on average in the peripheral blood cells of people with first episode psychosis. Um, interesting uh, epidemiological study from Scandinavia showed that um, amongst all individuals um, studied, those who had taken some NSAID in the past were less likely to wind up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia in the future. Um, and that relationship was highly significant among men, uh, getting nearly a 60% reduction in, psych in schizophrenia risk for previous use of NSAIDs. Um, and we could go on and on, but in the bottom, the bottom line bullet points um, show in meta-analysis, adding some NSAID to some existing antipsychotic drug seems to, on average, reduce the scores of psychotic symptoms. Uh, with a moderate effect size. So as I said, they're kind of hot in this field of study right now, but as I said, they're not for everybody. Um, the lots of countries have sort of centralized pharmacovigilance or adverse effect tracking systems. And in the US and in the UK, um, NSAIDs accounted for nearly a quarter of adverse, of adverse drug effects reported to those adverse effect monitoring systems. Um, in studies both in New Zealand and in Spain, um, neuropsychiatric adverse reactions were number three. Um, so they accounted for about a quarter of 20% to 25% of all adverse reactions. And of that group, um, about uh, well, number, the third leading cause of reactions were neuropsychiatric. You're probably asking what sorts of neuropsychiatric adverse effects were noted in these studies. Here is, for example, um, ranking the most common from most common to least common. There were still others, but I cut it off at, um, at this point beyond 11 uh, per the reporting period. Uh, dizziness, headache, and confusion. These are probably not surprising. Uh, but the ones that might be surprising are sleepiness, depression, hallucinations, um, and paranoia. Um, these are, to be clear, these are, we're talking about uncommon side effects. So we're looking at all reactions reported uh, between 1970 to 1989, and of all the reactions reported, only 20 or 19 were depression or hallucinations, respectively. So not common, but the signal is consistent. Here are, um, this is from a meta, this is from a kind of a meta-analysis paper by Ander and colleagues. Uh, we're looking at multiple reports from multiple national pharmacovigilance studies. In every single one of them, you see um, depression, hallucination, abnormal thinking, hallucination, and so forth. So it's a rare but consistent signal across multiple studies. Also from the Ander paper, um, they, they did a nice job of pulling out case reports. Uh, so here, don't bother reading this. The point of the point of this table is just to show there are many case reports, and case report usually involves we gave this drug to a person, and almost immediately after giving the drug, they had the reported adverse effect, uh, adverse uh, adverse event. The adverse event went away with cessation of the drug, and not uncommonly in case reports, they'll say, and then the person happened to take it again sometime, and it came back. Uh, so these are. These are credible case reports of uh, neuropsychiatric adverse effects, you know, revolving around psychosis, depression, uh, confusion, and so forth. So, like I said, not not common by any means, but consistent. Uh, to reiterate, typical pattern of NSAID-related psychosis is it's fairly rapid after you take the medicine, and it usually goes away when the medicine is out of the system. Um, that's typically less than 24 hours. So bottom line, it's a thing. 
Uh, next question is, why is it a thing? So what is it about NSAIDs that are causing this side effect? Um, and to get to that question, let's just take a brief review of what the nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are doing. Um, all of our cells have this lipid membrane that, that demarks the boundary of the cell. Uh, the cell membrane is a storage house for lots of fatty acids. Um, so it's an oily part and the oil helps keep the water from the outside away from the water on the inside of the cell. Um, arachidonic acid is one of many fatty acids that are stored inside this membrane. Uh, the cell membrane is really interesting because these fatty acids are not just sort of structural foundation molecules. They're actually used for a lot of other processes of life. And in the case of arachidonic acid, an enzyme called phospholipase, when activated, can release it. So you have arachidonic acid stored. When phospholipase gets a signal to turn on, then it releases arachidonic acid, becomes free. At this point, arachidonic acid is converted by an enzyme, abbreviated COX, C-O-X, stands for cyclooxygenase. Um, cyclooxygenase here acts on free arachidonic acid to turn it into a prostaglandin G or H, which is, a, think of it as a parent prostaglandin. And then that is immediately trans, uh, transformed into whatever prostaglandin the particular tissue is designed to receive. In the brain is primarily prostaglandin D2 and E2. Um, so that's the pathway. Key thing is that, well, key things for, you'll be quizzed on this in a minute. Um, phospholipase causes arachidonic acid to be liberated and cyclooxygenase is what turns arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. Um, so that's, that's the prostaglandins and that's where NSAIDs fit into the picture. Now let's talk about why uh, NSAIDs can possibly produce psychosis. Uh, they, have, they have many actions. These two are probably the most relevant to psychosis. Number one, um, the brain is set up so that blood flow will increase when certain cell populations are active. So it's like uh, on demand, um, supply of energy and oxygen. Um, here's a study in which they did genetic knockout. So they took away the COX-2 form of enzyme in mice. And um, here they're looking at blood flow in, a, in an area called whisker barrel cortex. So it's a region of the cerebral cortex, which is um, perceives sensory stimulation from whiskers of rats or mice and other animals that have whiskers for that matter. Um, and you'll see that when you wiggle the, the, the whiskers of the mouse, you get this rise of the blood flow in the area that's supposed to be receiving that sensory input. But in the COX-2 knockouts, they're then like um, genetic, we're giving them genetic prostaglandin inhibit, genetic insets here. You're taking away the COX and then you have this massive reduction of activity stimulated blood flow response. Uh, so that's a very important feature of what prostaglandins do in the brain giving aspirin or other NSAIDs to inhibit the COX enzyme will very likely result in decreasing this blood flow matching to neuronal demands. Um, a more widely studied and probably equally or more relevant explanation for why NSAIDs can cause psychosis is because prostaglandins function as kind of natural antipsychotic drugs. The prostaglandins are kind of breaks on the cell's um, ability to release dopamine. So when you give an animal or a human a whole bunch of prostaglandins or prostaglandin precursors, you will suppress the release of dopamine. Conversely, if you give an animal, we do this in animals so we know this for sure, and theoretically in humans as well, um, if you give them um, an NSAID to inhibit COX enzyme and thus inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, that is um, taking off the break. So then you can wind up with a surge of dopamine. And as I pointed out in the slide at the beginning, having surges of dopamine is a way to get psychosis. So all of this leads to a thing called prostaglandin hypothesis. Um, the champion of this was a guy named David Horobin um, who passed away in the early 2000s, but he wrote a whole bunch of papers on this topic. Um, and the prostaglandin hypothesis posits that and this is actually supported by evidence, um, that that phospholipase enzyme, whose job it is to release arachidonic acid from cell membranes, that is overactive in people with schizophrenia, or at least a subset of that, of that group. Um, 
And with overactive phospholipase, you deplete the cell membrane stores of arachidonic acid, which means that when you need arachidonic acid to make prostaglandins, it's not there. Um, and thus you're taking away the break from excessive dopamine release, and that's the setup for psychosis. Um, some other evidence uh, to support, some other observations to support this prostaglandin hypothesis is that on average, people with schizophrenia have very high pain tolerance, and that would be consistent with not making prostaglandins because prostaglandin is a pain signal. Um, people, it's, it's, it's often, it's usually unheard of that a person with schizophrenia will ever be diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. The rheumatoid arthritis risk among schizophrenia individuals is extraordinarily low. And that may be because they don't make, um, people with schizophrenia don't make this inflammatory set of molecules as well. Um, as, and also probably forgotten on modern learners, but um, back in the turn of the last century, um, we discovered that giving people, that people with psychosis who had fevers had a remission of psychotic symptoms during febrile states that actually led to the idea that we could induce fever deliberately as a treatment. And like around 1930, um, somebody got a Nobel prize for the idea of giving people malaria um, to induce fever. Um, it does, it's not quite as brutal as it sounds because malaria would reliably induce a fever every three or four, three or four days. And so if having a fever would be re causing remission of psychosis, the thought was that if we could do it reliably, we might have some uh, remission. So, I mean, it, it did work, and uh, but it's not the best way to do it if you wanna do that these days. Um, and there have been some very small proof of concept trials in which we give people drugs that stimulate prostaglandin production or in one, just giving them intravenous prostaglandin E2 and that's associated with reduction of psychosis symptoms. Uh, further, lots of very interesting drugs, lithium, like all the effective mood stabilizers, lithium, valproic acid, carbamase, and lamotrigine, all have in common that they reduce the turnover of arachidonic acid, thus making it more available for prostaglandin synthesis. Um, several antipsychotics have that effect, the most notable being clozapine, which has the most profound effect on arachidonic acid turnover, and horibin, um, says that or said that prostaglandin E and clozapine are structurally and functionally similar drugs. Uh, so there's that. So to conclude, um, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs block the synthesis of prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are very important in telling the brain to get more blood to areas that are active, as well as prostaglandins function as a break on dopamine release. So inhibiting prostaglandins can inhibit some important facets of brain function, which may render people with other vulnerabilities to psychosis more likely to experience it. Um, the idea that NSAIDs can help some people with schizophrenia to have less psychosis, but it can make some others worse um, is kind of proof that this thing we call schizophrenia is not a single disease. It's actually multiple different biochemical pathways to a similar symptom picture. Uh, so uh, it's gonna be an extremely rare find, but if you ever are encountering a case where a person has inexplicable episodes of psychosis um, or is having these surges of um, exacerbated symptoms, do check for non-steroidal and inflammatory use and uh, make sure that it's, you're not looking at that. Uh, we'll send out PDF of the slides and then these are all the references for all the studies that I referenced earlier.